Okay, I'm calling this meeting to order uh, for the world. This is um, Siva Janata, the chair of the Whippany River uh, Watershed Action Committee. Therefore, I'm calling the meeting for Wednesday, May 5th, 2021 to order. And uh, I'll just go around uh, the room. I, again, I said, I'm the chair of the of WARWA and we can just go and introduce ourselves. Larry, you Sure. Want to... I'm Larry Gendorf. I am the vice chair of the uh, WARWAC and I am the county representative and uh, serve as the executive director of the Morris County Municipal Utilities Authority in uh, my nine to five. Welcome everyone. Okay. And John, John Hoover. Yeah, uh, I'm, um, I'm the uh, representative from the uh, Madison Borough Council to the uh, Whippany River Watershed Action Committee. That's me. Thanks, and Dennis. Yeah, I'm Dennis Dietrich, I'm from Hanover Township. Uh, I'm the uh, member at large, um, not because of my size. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm part of the uh, uh, Hanover Township Green Team, Environmental Commission, uh, et cetera. And Judy. Hi, um, I'm from Parsippany. I'm the representative from Parsippany. I'm the vice chair of the environmental committee and I'm a co-leader of the Parsippany Green Team. Thanks. And uh, uh, we'll start with our guest, uh, Damon, Damon Lofton. Uh, uh, yes, hi. Um, I live in Mars Plains. I'm a citizen sciencer, um, if you want to call it that. Um, our family also owns um, pediatrics of Mars Town. Mm -hmm. Here in town, my wife is Dr. Zambrano, and together we run our medical practices. But I'm just an outdoorsman, local guy for 18 years. Uh, was busy knowing that I didn't know that you guys existed. I've been here for 18 years, and I'm um, happy to have found you. Great. Thanks. And uh, I think Allison's coming on, but I'll uh, go around. Uh, Fern, Fern Walken. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank Siva for inviting me tonight. Um, I can beat Damon by the fact that I <laughs> didn't know. I've been here 30 plus years and I did not know about this committee. So kudos to you guys. Um, the reason I'm here, one of the reasons I'm here um, is that I live in Hanover Township. So hello to Dennis Dietrich, I'd like to talk to you. Um, and I have been um, trying to get uh, the pathways along the river cleaned up. They are an absolute disaster. And um, been calling the township who's telling me it's the county and so on and so forth. So to make things short, I do my own cleanup, but it has gotten so big there there's industry along it there's huge pieces of cardboard and plastic and all kinds of stuff that a mere mortal cannot pick up on their walk uh, every day so i wanted to know what i can do to get this moving in hanover township thanks fern and uh, actually cedar knows is on the agenda so Great. we'll talk a bit, a bit about that Allison, we're going around uh, introducing ourselves. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Allison Deeb, and I am the WARWAC for facilitator. I uh, have been with WARWAC since 2009. I started as the mayoral appointment and then was hired to be the administrator and then took a short break and then was hired to be the facilitator back last January. So I'm very honored to be here and to help facilitate any programs and projects with uh, the towns. Uh, and um, that's about it. And to go further with our guest, Liz Moriello, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, my name is uh, Liz Moriello. I'm Dennis's daughter. Okay. And nice. Really? Oh my God. <laughs> Dennis, honestly. <laughs> um, and he invited me to this uh, presentation tonight because he knows that I am a birder with my husband and we have birded in New Jersey, even though we now live in Maryland. <laughs> oh, excellent. Uh, well, glad you could make it. And Kathy Horahan, you want to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, I live with Larry. Um, so I, uh, I heard about it through him and, um, <laughs> I am very interested in learning more about birds. So I'm looking forward to the presenter tonight. 
Thank you, and uh, you're all welcome. And Ingrid, are you, Were you married to Ingrid? <laughs> yeah, who do you live with, Ingrid? Hi. Um, my name is, yes, my name is Ingrid. Oh, you muted. We couldn't get you, Ingrid. <clears throat> yes, my name is Ingrid Lewis. And um, my name is on the list because okay. I signed up oh, for Han at Hanover Township Day back in September 2019. So I've been getting the emails, and my interest is in the backyard breeding. Okay, welcome. Yeah. And uh, and uh, C. Vidal, can you introduce yourself, please? Thank Hi, you. my name is Chris. I live in East Hanover, and I participated in your cleanup in Morristown this weekend. Yes. Hi, thank oh, you. Oh, that's right. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, you, you were just a name before, so now that I can see your, yeah, thank you for God joining uh, the cleanup. And uh, I think uh, that's all we have. And then, and of course, our guest today, guest speaker today is Jim Walker of Wild Birds Unlimited. And I'll let Jim tell and uh, give his presentation. Jim? Sure. sure, thank you very much, folks. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. Um, and just to kind of set the stage a little bit, uh, this presentation that I, I've modified is usually about an hour long, so I'm trying to do it within the 20 minute window and um, kind of leave 30, you know, a couple minutes, 10 minutes for, or so for questions. Um, this is primarily geared for your backyard bird feeding, so not necessarily for birders, uh, hikes, and binoculars as, as maybe the agenda had indicated. Um, so, um, what I'll be talking about today in kind of in, in a bullet form is um, top 10 or the top bird feeding mistakes that you might make in your backyard. Get right to it. I assume you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. So, Realizing that, that I don't have a lot of time, I'm gonna go as slowly but as efficiently as possible. So if we could just hold our questions to the end, um, that'd be great and we can you know, open it up uh, at the end for, for whatever questions you may have. So like I mentioned, um, I'll be talking about the top mistakes of backyard bird feeding. Uh, I am the owner of Wild Birds Unlimited in New Jersey, uh, Denville, New Jersey. We're a franchise, there's 350 stores across the country. I've been in this store for about a little more than a year. I opened up in January of last year. And our mission of Wild Birds Unlimited is to bring people and nature together and to do it with excellence. Um, we do it with excellence by the knowledge that we have that we share with our customers. This is not your typical retail store where it's, you know, you, you, you pick something up and come to the cash register. We help our customers with their backyards and make bringing more joy into the backyards through our knowledge, through our products and our services, but also with the partnerships. Um, so we partner with folks like Whippany River Watershed to um, you know, help bring nature um, and awareness to more um, nature. And we, we do it primarily with the backyard, but we open it up to you know, larger areas as well. Um, so why do we feed the birds? Well, there's about 32 different bird species that are common within New Jersey that are regular feed, uh, bird. You look at just them in general, lots of different colors, shapes, sizes. Their activity is, is, is different as well. What they eat is different. But when you bring in the females into it as well, you know, there's just a lot more variety. And the more birds you get, the more joy we feel we have. We like watching their behavior. This time of year in particular, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, you know, nests are being built, um, pairs are being formed, um, courtship rituals are occurring. You, you may have seen what cardinals do. They actually will share seed and feed each other during their courtship uh, uh, rituals. 
um, molting and migration and you know lots of different things are going on in your backyard um, and all that you know, can be observed and every day can be a little bit different based on you know the activity that's happening in your backyard. Um, observation and discovery, you know, just simply asking questions of what kind of bird is that? Where does it live? How do you feed it? Um, you know, how, how do we keep it safe? You know, that, all that curiosity around nature and, and birds in particular raises questions that, that just bring interaction, bring people together. Um, the store has a lot of um, grandparents coming in with their, their grandkids and just the interaction and the sharing that, that occurs within the store is, is very, very uh, apparent and very enjoyable. Um, giving back to nature. I mean, uh, listening to the lady talk about what's happening with the river uh, where she lives, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of harm to, to this world, to this earth. And if we can just give a little bit back by making each backyard a little bit more productive, a little bit safer, a um, little bit healthier for the birds, you know, we're giving back to nature. And um, if we're able to do that one yard at a time, you know, one section of a stream at a time, you know, all the little pieces add up to a, to a much bitter, a bigger good. So um, I got into this business, came, came out of the corporate world. Um, backyard bird feeding was a hobby of mine. And when I was researching different businesses to leave the corporate world, you know, when I came across this franchise, it didn't take me long to figure out that so you know, I can be doing good by helping each of my customers do a little bit better in their backyard. Uh, it's been it's been quite a quite an enjoyable experience so far. Um, and of course, gives our cats entertainment too. But I'll be uh, I just one one with the note on the on the cats. Keep them indoors. Cats are the number two um, killer of birds. So uh, the first is window strikes, and cats are number two. So keep them indoors, but uh, my cat in particular enjoys watching the feeders. Um, so what are, what are the top mistakes of backyard bird feeding? Um, I don't necessarily like this title, but I, I, I kind of use it as a way to say, you know, um, let's, let's learn from different ways of making your backyard better. And we have 12 different areas that we'll be touching upon here going forward. Um, so I have a slide in each one of these, and uh, hopefully you'll get some good or new information from this. So first one, <clears throat> high quality seed is, is absolutely paramount. Um, we get our seed shipment in once a week. A seed is a consumable. It does go bad. Birds can tell the difference. Um, the number one seed that the birds enjoy um, that's going to attract the widest variety of birds is black oil sunflower seed. That comes in forms of in shell and out of shell and in chips. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a, a favorite. If you're looking at any type of blend out there, that should be the number one ingredient. Uh, when you add peanuts, you're going to get more of different types of birds. So your blue jays, your woodpeckers, nuthatches really love peanuts. If they have a choice between sunflower seed and peanuts, they're gonna go for a peanut every time. Um, ground feeding birds like millet, and it should be white prozo millet, not your red millet. Um, your doves, your chipping sparrows, the juncos when they're around, really like the millet when that's blended in with the other seeds as well. And then there's, you, know, you may wanna consider a no mess blend uh, without shells. Uh, that's great because it's obviously not gonna leave any mess on, on ground, but you're also getting um, more value for the, the, your, your dollar because it's all seed and no shells. About two bags of shelled, of shells, seed with shells equals one bag without. Um, and you gotta be careful of, of your bargain um, basement brands. A lot of them have filler seeds. We like to say anything that has red in it, so red milo, red millet, red wheat grain of some sort, um, the birds in this area just don't eat, or put it this way, the birds that do eat it, you really don't want around. Your sparrows, your starlings, pigeons, things of that nature will eat the fillers. They, they are put in there to bring the boss down. Um, so just be, be aware. Um, and also be, be aware of big box stores. 
um, primarily because a lot of that seed sits in storage and it's not clear how long it's actually taken to get to the store and how old it actually is. So that's number one, make sure it's fresh and good quality. Um, using one type of feeder is also um, you know, discouraged, primarily because it, it, each bird, not every bird can accommodate every feeder. You can see that's that tail prop suet feeder. That's really built for a woodpecker. It has that tail prop at the bottom that makes it comfortable for the woodpecker to eat. Um, your cardinal's not gonna be able to eat from that. Um, suet is a high fat, um, high protein, depending on the ingredients, high protein meal, and your woodpeckers love it. Um, but then when you add like a hopper feeder or a seed tube feeder with a tray, you're gonna be able to now accommodate other different types of birds. Um, by having multiple feeders within the same area also spreads out competition. So, you know, certain, there is a hierarchy of dominance at a feeder. Um, this red-bellied woodpecker on the suet feeder is actually at the highest. Um, they're, they're the most dominant of the feeder. When they come, all, most other birds move. Then you have your blue jays and your starlings. When those birds are there, they're going to they're gonna kind of take over that feeder. So when you have others that they, other birds can go to, you're spreading out that competition and therefore um, bringing more you know, variety to your, to your backyard as well. So we definitely recommend having multiple types of feeders um, and multiple type, and different types of seed as well. Um, mistake number three is letting your squirrel, letting your squirrel, letting your feeders go empty. Um, the feeder on the left looks kind of boring. Um, the feeder on the right, you know, they will come and keep checking them out. And it's it's not, not that the birds are dependent on the food. It's you're putting it out there for a reason, and you're putting it out there to you know. One, feed the birds, but to enjoy their activity. So when it's empty, it's not really doing any good. It also takes time for them to find it. So once you find them and you start gaining, you know, they, 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 you start gaining that activity, um, they're gonna keep coming back and you're gonna, they're gonna bring their friends and, and you're gonna have even more activity as it goes along. So you know, keeping the feeders full um, you know, it, it's important. Um, regularly or not regularly cleaning your feeders. Um, feeders should be cleaned you know, pretty much every, at least once a month. Um, and in the summer months, you know, sometimes even more. Um, we do recommend a light bleach solution, very, very light, one to nine, um, and to rinse it off very uh, carefully um, or very completely and let it air dry. And obviously always wash your hands every time. You're, you're killing bacteria when you're cleaning the feeders. Um, when they get wet, bacteria can grow. Um, you know, each seed it does have some components of dust that's going to settle at the bottom of the feeder. Um, we do recommend, you know, feeders are, one of our feeders has an easy release bottom. So, you know, getting to the bottom of the feeders, you know, not always easy. So look for feeders that, that, that are convenient for you to use and easy for you to clean. Um, it's easy to open as well. So, the more you clean it, the better it's going to be, and the easier it is to clean. But you know, the more right, more more often you'll actually do it. Number five, feeding. Do not feed bread to birds. Um, there's really no nutritional value. It actually harms them because they're using energy to digest something that really doesn't provide any nutritional value to them, um, and it really only does attract, you know pigeons and sparrows and, and most of your non, um, not unwanted birds, put it that way. Neglecting your hummingbird nectar, very, very important. Um, especially this time of year, the hummingbirds are coming through. Um, the males have made their way or are making their way. We, we have a map that we track in the store. Uh, it comes from a website called hummingbirdcentral.com and it is just a, a red streak all the way up through Massachusetts. Um, the males come through first. That's a male ruby-throated hummingbird on the feeder there. They are looking for nesting spots. And they, you know, if they find your food, then uh, find the food, then maybe they have a, you have more of a, you have more of a chance of one of them staying in your backyard to attract a mate and, and stay the entire summer. Um, neck, it's, I call it a little bit of a labor of love. Once you get the hummingbird, they're outstanding. They're, they're an awful lot of fun. Um, but you do need to maintain uh, its freshness. It's simply sugar water. Um, the recipe is, is just cane sugar. Don't use any 
um, agave sugar or sugar in the raw or any type of um, honey. It, it's regular white cane sugar, one cup to four cups of water. Um, I recommend you warm up one cup or the, uh, of water, pour the cup of sugar in, dissolve to get it to dissolve, and then add the add the regular water, the, the, the remaining water in. Um, you know, I don't think you need to boil it for two minutes. Um, it's not necessary, in my opinion, but you can store up to two to three weeks in the refrigerator, but then you're changing it, you know, based on the temperature. You know, when it gets in the heat of the summer, you really want to change it daily. Um, so, like I said, it's um, a little bit of labor love, but once you get those hummingbirds, uh, they love it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, also, planting, you know, nectar generating plants will certainly help attract them as well. Um, not providing a water source. Um, water actually is, is more important to birds than it is, the water source is more important to birds than it is to us. So we don't retain water, I'm sorry, birds don't retain water the same way as we do. Um, so they're continually drinking from the, the, the bird bath. I call it more of a bird fountain than a bird bath because I see them drinking more often than they bathe. Um, but there's you know, different ways to attract them as well. Um, the one in the upper right is a robin, it's a dripper. If you have water, a dripper, the, the birds are gonna sit under the drip and, and bathe themselves. Um, misters are really good for hummingbirds. Um, when you get anything that's agitating the water like a drip or a mister, or we have a thing called a water wiggler that just agitates the water, that's gonna bring attraction from the, the ripples and the reflection. And you're going to get a lot of non-seeding, non-seed eating birds as well. So your your, your migrating birds coming through will will um, be able to um, you'll find that as well. So you'll see you see a much wider variety of birds when you get the water there as well. Um, ignoring natural food sources, um, I, I, native plants, and I'm just learning more about this and the importance of native plants to not just you know your backyard. Um, and to, to, to the fauna, but to uh, birds in general. Um, we have a lot of invasive species plants that, that are out there that really aren't producing the caterpillars or the moths um, that, that, that the birds need. So 98% of a baby bird's diet are caterpillars. And, and the native plant, the invasive plants aren't producing those caterpillars. So, Anytime you can reduce an invasive species with a native species, you're doing you know, quite a bit of, of good. Um, but those, those plants are producing alternative food sources. Um, I don't know if people, those that have been feeding, bird, do feed birds, notice that the blue jays were gone last, pretty much this winter. Um, I, at least in my backyard, they were gone. And primarily, I believe it's because the acorn uh, production was way down. Um, they love acorns. They hide acorns, um, and and you know you see the birds, the, the wax wings in the lower left. They love those berries. The the, the goldfinches are eating thistle. So there's a lot of alternative birds, you know, food sources that you can get in your backyard that not only help the birds but are going birds, but are going to be able to attract different types of birds to your backyard. Um, eight, not feeding all year. Um, I get the question a lot: Do birds become dependent on us? And the answer is no. They've been around for a lot, a lot longer than we have. Uh, studies have shown that birds only supplement their diet by about 20% with a backyard bird feeder. Um, but however, they do remember where their food sources are. So they will continually come back. Um, in the winter, and each season has different stress points for the birds. So in the winter, obviously, there's less food source and they need the energy to kind of get through the cold nights. Um, in the spring, there's nesting, there's molting, there's migration. Um, in the summer, they're still feeding their young. Um, there's, you know, although there's maybe more natural food sources, um, water becomes obviously very important in the summer as well. Um, in the spring, they're going through another molt, they're going through migration. Um, so, you know, Feeding year round is, is definitely beneficial uh, for the birds. Also, like I mentioned earlier, you, you, you know, you've set up a bird feeder for your benefit um, and your joy, and you've attracted the birds. Once you take that food source away, it will take time to get it back to where it was after, you know, if you've had a feeder up for quite some time. So might as well. You don't need to feed to the same degree, the same number of feeders, but certainly, um, you know, having them out year round um, is, is a benefit. 
Um, 10, not protecting your bird feeder. And what I mean by that is, is, is two things. One, to keep them dry on the right. Um, keeping the feeders dry will obviously keep the seed dry, um, keep it fresher and keep it, you know, the birds will enjoy it more. Um, and keeping squirrels away from the feeders as well. The squirrels will do damage. They obviously eat the good stuff. Um, there's squirrel proof feeders. Um, and the far left is a baffle that works outstanding. That's definitely the tried and true way of keeping squirrels off your feeder. But um, keeping, keeping your feeders dry and um, clean and um, you know, away from you know, creatures that might damage them, obviously is gonna be important. The, the health of the, the birds going to. Um, not properly storing your seed. Seed is a consumable, it will go bad. If you buy a seed with a preservative, do not buy it. Or if you see a seed with a preservative, do not buy it. Um, I don't like to sell any more seed than my customer can use within um, you know, 45 to 60 days. If you don't store it in a, in a solid container on the right, you know, your critters will get to it. Um, on the left is what you would normally see. It's a pantry moth. Uh, they, they do find their way into seeds. Um, I change my seeds so often in my store that I've not had an issue with any type of moths or anything in my store. So keeping it clean in a clean container, clean area is, is important. Um, thistle, uh, what the goldfinches really like, that I won't sell more than somebody can go through within 30 days. That actually dries up um, quickly. And uh, the, if it dries up, the birds just won't eat it. Number 12, last one here, um, wrong feeder placements and lots of different things kind of to talk about here. Most important is on the right. I mean, most important, at least in terms of why we feed the birds is you wanna put it in a place that you can see it. You wanna put it in a place that's, that, that you can enjoy it. I like to say, if you don't see it, you won't tend to it. If you don't tend to it, to it I'm sorry. If you don't see it, you won't enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, you're not gonna to tend to it. Um, so, you know, like I said, cleaning and filling and maintaining is, is important. So put it in a place you can see it and you can enjoy it. Um, upper left, um, we have two different things that are going on there. One is a squirrel proof zone. So squirrels can jump eight to 10 feet, launch themselves from gutter lines, launch themselves from trees. So put your feeders 10 feet away from, from some place they can jump. And then that baffle that you see, that cone shaped thing, um, you want that at least five feet away. So uh, five feet above the ground because squirrels can jump five feet. But then uh, from a safety perspective, um, I mentioned cats earlier, um, but there's a thing called the window strike zone. Uh, window strikes are actually the number one cause of bird deaths. Um, primarily uh, the, the skyscrapers, uh, the big cities. But if, for your, your home, um, birds see the reflection off the window. And they think that they can fly to them thinking it's a tree. Um, so even though it might not be in a squirrel proof zone, having your feeder within three feet, if you want it, if you're gonna have it close to your window is important because the birds won't be flying fast enough to injure themselves. And then you want it beyond 10 feet because it gives them a chance to divert and, and move, you know, kind of fly away from the window when they, when they realize it's there. Um, there are things you can do to put on a window to help uh, alleviate window strikes if you find that it's, it's a common occurrence, and I can certainly talk more about that. There's decals and, and screamers and other things you can do. Um, but then I mentioned cats. Keep your cats indoors, but you know there's a lot of feral cats out there. Um, if you know your neighbor has one of those, um, put, your, put your feeder at least five feet away from ground cover to at least give your birds a fighting chance against the cat. Um, but, um, but they are, but, but, but be, be aware of what's happening in your backyard and, and try to keep your feet safe. So that's, that's what I had for today. Um, a lot more that we can talk about. I can, you know, I could spend 10 minutes on you know, each of these. The presentation that I normally do if I had an hour is, is actually called the joys of backyard bird feeding, which sounds a little bit better than your, your top <laughs> mistakes. But uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. I think I saw some chats. I'm not sure how to get to them. Um, but okay, I, I can uh, go through some of the questions. And, sure. and if anybody else 
wants to, they can uh, do. I think the first question I think uh, says, how do you discourage blackbirds uh, from overwhelming our feeders? Yeah, great question. So um, grackles, starlings, red-winged blackbirds, um, they migrate together. Um, there is a type of food that they cannot eat because they can't crack the shell. It's called safflower, S-A-F-F-L-O-W-E-R. Um, it's still a favorite of many birds. It's actually much of, a very much a favorite of cardinals. Um, so switching to that absolutely works, but you have to be committed to it. So if you switch to it, you have to switch it out completely. Otherwise the birds will just go to the other feeders. Um, also, there are cages users that, this, that the, those birds can't get in. Um, obviously, the larger birds like cardinals and blue jays wouldn't be able to as well. Okay, and um, another question. Uh, when you mentioned about washing with diluted bleach, would uh, white vinegar work um, as well or? Yeah, I mean, it, it, anything, well, I, I actually, I know some folks do that. I just, the answer I, I'm saying is yes, but as I'm saying that is, I'm not sure if vinegar would kill bacteria. Okay. That would be a question back to you guys. And I'm looking at uh, some of the other questions. Hey Jim, how would you stop uh, birds from flying into your windows? Yeah, so, so um, one, you wanna have your feeder, uh, like I mentioned at the end, three within three feet or 10 feet to at least alleviate their, their chances of getting, you know, hitting the window. Or if they do, they're, they're so close at three feet that they won't get harmed. There's ultraviolet window decals that uh, my customers have used and have reported back to say that they work. Um, it, it looks like a haze to us, but it's an ultraviolet reflection to them. Um, you need to do anything you can do to reduce the reflection um, is, is what you wanna to try to accomplish. Some of that times that could be from with just in, inside with uh, shutters or, or curtains. Um, you can put streamers on the windows and that certainly isn't maybe the most attractive, but that type of distraction, just so they can see the, the, the contrast is, uh, is helpful. Okay, does anybody else have any other questions? I mean, I think I see most of the chat questions. Jim, um, how do you, how did you get started in, in birding and, um, you know, can you talk about how you first got started in it and, um, you know, what was your experience and motivating you and, and, and all of that? Yeah, it, well, so huh, I guess I'll go, go start the other direction. Why, you know, what I left. So I was in the corporate world for 25 some odd years. I was in high tech sales, running global sales teams and really just kind of hit, hit a pretty hard wall about four years ago and needed to try to find an exit strategy. Um, and that, that caused me to do the research on the franchise. But I got into birds um, when I was about eight years old, I was hiking to a fishing place with one of my buddies and I saw a flock of goldfinches flying by. And I just was like, how do I, how do I, who, who, what is that? You know, I had, did some research on, I'm like, oh my gosh, my goal was to try to attract a goldfinch. And from that day on, I call it the, uh, the, the um, anyway, um, I, I started feeding the birds and I've been feeding birds ever since. So it's always just been a hobby of mine. And then once I found the franchise is, is you know, something that could be a possible business opportunity. I was like, first, can you make money? Yeah, okay. And then, and then it was, is the franchise good? And yes. And then the third was, you know, what is going to be the, the store experience? Well, I don't want to work a retail store. And handily, it's not a retail store. It's a retail environment. Yes, it's a business, but it's a consultation. It's an education. Every customer that, I, that comes in, um, it, it's a conversation. It's, it's, you know, so my staff is, is very well knowledge in the bird, in the birding hobby, um, very well knowledge on the products. And, and we're here to help make uh, customers' backyards more enjoyable through, through backyard bird feeding. Thanks. Uh, excellent. Um, there's also a question about, um, uh, there was a couple questions about feral cats. And I know you talked about just keeping cats away. Um, there is a, uh, 
uh, TNR policy in some towns, trap, neuter, release. Um, do you, I know uh, there's a wild cat in my neighborhood um, that hunts. So uh, what I advise people to do is make sure um, if there is a cat that's hunting to get the, the cat licensed, um, there are licenses in some towns for cats, but do you have any um, solutions uh, that you can offer on that? And, I mean, not specific to the cats. Um, I mean, I think what you mentioned is each town is going to be a little bit different. Um, if it does become an issue, you know, a lot of times it's a neighborly, a neighbor conversation, right? So, because they're not your cats in many, many cases. Um, obviously, if it becomes a health hazard or, or an issue, reporting it to the town is, is what I would recommend. That being said, um, if you're feeding the birds, keep your bird feeders out in the open. So away from ground cover, away from areas where the cat can hide. If it's out in the open, you know, cat kind of getting out there, the birds will have a chance. I mean, they're aware. So, you know, when a hawk, you know, I get questions about hawks as well. I mean, hawks are a concern with birds, but, you know, that's, that's part of nature and, and birds communicate with each other. So they, they like to be together. So keeping your feeders together makes sense um, because they're going to they react and the others respond. So um, the only advice with cats is, is keeping the feeders in a place where the cats can't sneak up on them and they, and they can see them. Okay. Um, there was also a question about um, where your store is located. Can sure. you put that slide up again that shows your contact information? Um, and while you're doing that, what has been your experience with, with bears and bird yep. feeders? Yep. And how can we um, ensure safety in that regard? Yeah, so bears obviously in this area are, are, are a concern and they're a question that I question I get all the time. I live in Mendham, I have bears. Um, the first thing is bring your feeder. Well, first thing is obviously be aware of your surroundings. So when you're in and around your backyard, you always be aware. I, I do keep an air horn in my backyard, not for you know my safety as much as just keep scaring the bear when I do see them. Um, I've never felt threatened. You don't hear too often, you, know, you don't really hear really any major incidents with between humans and, and, and the black bears. That being said, you got need to be respectful and be cognizant. Um, I bring my feeders in every night. So um, that helps reduce the issue. Um, bears are, you know, they, they will be up earlier than us and they will you know, kind of go to bed a little bit later than us too sometimes. Um, so they are there, you know, during the day at times, but most of the time they, they don't want to be, you know, engaged where, where humans are. So bringing them in every night is, is recommendation number one. If, you know, we do have in the store a bear proof feeding station. It's an aerial station that, that is on a pole that's 14 feet above the ground that cements in. That does work. We have had success with that um, with, with, with several, with quite a few customers. Um, and then uh, there's the other thing that, that we can help with is if some folks would put together and put out an electric fence around the feeder, um, just like they do around beehives. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it was very I interesting. Wonder. Jim, and, a, another question just popped up in the chat. Do hummingbird feeders attract ants? Yes. So sugar. So you want to make sure that your hummingbird feeder doesn't leak. Number one, there's many out there that do. Um, I we don't necessarily like the hummingbird feeders that, that have a jar above the feeding holes that, that is gravity fed. Those tend to leak, um, and they leak one because the seal doesn't work so well all the time, and two. When there is an air pocket in there and it warms up, it creates pressure that pushes down on the, on the liquid that pushes it out of the feeding holes. Um, if you do get ants, um, you can, we have what are called ant moats that can hang between the feeder and the um, hole that it's coming from, that, that it's hanging from, fill it with water and they, they won't be able to cross that. There's also a gel that we sell that's a barrier that you put a, a strip of it around a pole and they won't cross that either. 
Thank you. You're so incredibly knowledgeable. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's another question. Uh, what type of feed will attract cardinals? And is there a certain time of year that cardinals are more likely to be here? So cardinals are year-round residents. Um, they do have you know, small migrations that they do in, in like small short geographic migrations, but they are pretty territorial. Um, so, you know, they do have their, their space, which does overlap. So you can get multiple pairs of cardinals at your, at your feeder. Um, they like sunflower chips and they like safflower. Those in particular are the two that they like the most. Cardinals do not do what, do not do well on a feeder like this with a perch. Um, they like to eat facing forward. So we recommend a tray at the bottom or a tray that has, uh, or, or, or more of a tray that, or a feeder that has more of a, a perch, a tray perch or a longer perch that they can, that they can sit on. Do you have a picture of that instead of your uh, uh, address that you could put, pop up? This is a great, this is a great uh, feeder for cardinals. It's got a, it's got a tree here, you fill it here. So it's got large capacity and they- It's not on the screen. Most every bird. This is actually one of our squirrel proof feeders that also works really well for cardinals because they can sit on this ring. The photo well, um, is not on the screen. You want to uh, sh uh, stop sharing for um, Jim? And oh, then So they can see, okay. Oh, I'm looking. <laughs> I guess it's, <laughs> Dennis, you can also make it bigger. Oh. Yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, so this is a squirrel proof feeder. This ring is called a cardinal ring because they could sit there. It's squirrel proof because when you push down on it, the holes close. Squirrel buster, I have one. They're great. Yeah, yeah, they work great. And then this is the other feeder just so this is not squirrel proof, but it, you can see it has a, a lid on, lip on it that the feed, uh, feed dispenses through here and fills here and, and that can accommodate the cardinals as well. Oh, cool. Okay. Barry talking to us? I don't know. Sorry. You think I apologize. I was on mute. How do you make them that you could make them high enough, but you could bring them in each night? Uh, for make them high enough for what? Off the ground to keep them away from yeah, I mean, the so cats and the squirrel. So we have, I mean, so we have a pole system. I mean, like this would be so much more fun if you guys were in the store. Um, <laughs> we have a pole system that screws into the ground, and when this is in the ground, it's seven feet high. Okay. Um, and then you can have there's, there's two branch arms, but you can have multiple arms on it. It's seven feet high, so, so you're still able. To, and when you have a feeder that's stiff, you can you can kind of still reach. So I don't okay. have an issue. And then what I do is I have like eight feeders at home. I just Put them on my arm. I carry them to my shed. I fill them every night, and then uh, I put them back out in the morning. It takes me about seven and a half minutes to do that. Cool. Wow. Um, Jim, there's a poster behind you in your store, and it says mm -hmm. 12 elements of yeah. a thoughtful bird feeding station." Did Did you go over that in your presentation? Um, sort of. I mean, it talks about. Uh, feeders, the different, having more than one type of feeder, that's number one through six. We talk about water. Um, we talk about, so not really to specifically that degree, but we, we touched upon it. Um, that's, a, that's a different presentation that, that I do that, that can go through all the different types of feeders. And we'll have to have you, we'll have to have you back and, uh, I just want to echo that we have a pole and it's great. Um, we have installed in our backyard. Uh, however, a bear did come into my townhouse development a few years ago, pulled the whole pole down and broke it and picked up the bird feeder like it was a beer keg. And um, <laughs> so I'm seriously going to give some thought to taking in the, the feeder well, every so night. So the other thing that I do, and, and, and I know you guys, just tell me when to cut me off too, because I know you guys got a, a lot no, of other good. agenda items. Um, I put my feeders on, it, so the pole system that I showed you screws into the ground. If the bear were to take that, it, they would snap it in half. What I do is I put my, my feeders on a, like an umbrella stand. 
this. Mm -hmm. And this way, when, if, you, if the bear happens to come and, and you ha haven't gotten your feeders in, it just knocks the whole stand over and it won't break the pole. Um, that happens to me. As long as the bear can get to the food, it's not going to do any damage. I have some customers that actually feed the bear. All the feeders are at three feet or more. They don't care about the squirrels, of course, but the bear comes, licks what he needs, and he goes on. He doesn't do any damage to anything. So the damage from both bears and squirrels occur when they can't get to the food. Squirrels do most of the damage to feeders when a feeder's empty because they think there's something there and they're gonna go chewing on it to try to get to it. Bears are gonna do damage to your feeders when they can't get to them and then they pull them and they wanna shake something. So. Mm. This is great. You're such a wellful of knowledge. Um, Thank you. Thanks, I want to go to your store uh, tomorrow. Please. Yeah. And <laughs> I have to get a new pole because the bear broke it <laughs> and bent it. And I don't like having a crooked pole in front of my house, but but thank you. And yep. are there any one last question for, for Jim before we go on? I mean, this was definitely one of the most uh, exciting presentations we've had in a while. Usually we have pretty boring presentations <laughs> about the DEP uh, stormwater regulations and rules. And, and um, <laughs> so I know this is being recorded, so don't shoot me anybody, but we do have to study those rules uh, for sure. And we have to understand those to protect the watershed. But this is wonderful. We'll definitely have oh, you back. Could I ask one more question? Sorry. Oh, oh sure. Fine for one more. Yes. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, Jim, could you just discuss a little bit if um, bird baths, I always have like a fear that they could become a mosquito breeding ground. And I know well, you talked about the dripper, which sounded yep. good, and yep. the, um, the vibrator thing. So yep. it, I'm guessing so, it's important that you not just have a stagnant bird bath well so the way i the way i say it to my customers is if you have mosquitoes in your bird bath you have a dirty bird bath and you're not paying attention to it you should be you should be cleaning your bird bath once a week and cleaning it meaning just change the water just just you know just push the water out i i you know so if you have an active bird bath um on a summer day it's mine's drained so meaning the, the, the bars have splashed it out, it evaporates. Um, so the, the dripper and the agitator definitely help keep the motion going, which makes it harder for mosquitoes if it, if they are, if it is sitting there longer. The other thing is you don't want a deep bird bath because the birds really can't bathe in it. It's too deep. Um, if, if a bird bath, somebody comes in with a really deep bird bath, I recommend layering rocks so you kind of have tears in it. But it should just be, you know, it should be no more than an inch, you know, two inches at the most of water. And, and you really, you're just tending to it a little bit more often. Great. Thank you. Great. Great. Right. Thanks, Jim. All right. Thank you. Um, Allison, la last thing for you. I did reach out to my uh, bird walker and he is available on the 12th and he likes 7 a.m. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Can you, uh, should I reach yeah, out I'll to shoot. you? Yeah, shoot, shoot. If you can shoot me a note. And just so we can kind of, uh, and I'll connect the dots. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, folks. Appreciate Thank it. Look forward you, to seeing man. you in the store and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, your agenda. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Right. Thanks, and, Jim. and before we go on, I uh, think we have a new guest, Jason Leffler. Jason, you want to... Uh... Pleasure to meet you all. <laughs> nice to meet you, Jason. And Jason was one of our um, uh, volunteers at the cleanup. Thanks. And now uh, we go on to the uh, me, uh, agenda. The first up is the meeting meeting minutes from the last uh, last meeting. If anybody has any questions on that, uh, please uh, let us know. And if not, we'll just go to call for. Uh, well, they look good to me. I'll make a motion to approve them. I'll anybody? second it. Okay. And uh, any anybody for approving? All approve. All approve. Aye. Aye. And uh, any of the nays? Okay, so the meetings, meeting minutes have been approved. And now the uh, treasury report from Larry. Larry okay, can... just quickly give you a summary on where we are for the year as far as the Whippany River watershed. Uh,
we have taken in between membership dues and donations, $6,292.86. And that is also having expenses of $3,613.30 so far year to date, leaving us a in total income at this point of $2,679.56. Uh, and that's all I really wish to report at this point. There was no new activity since our executive committee meeting in mid-April as far as any activity in the bank account, either okay. making uh, payments and or receiving any payments. And uh, I, I did, I just uh, in terms of uh, donations and, um, uh, and income, $4,500 check came in from um, from your group, MDM, okay. uh, Morris County MUA. So I have to deposit that deposit this week. That. Good. And uh, also I got a cash donation of $100 plus uh, about nine or $10 small donations in the bucket, which also need to be deposited. So we got, awesome. so we got uh, a sizable amount coming in. And now uh, Allison Deeb with the facilitator, facilitator report. Sure, thank you. Uh, I apologize. I don't have a written report tonight, okay. but uh, I will just verbally state uh, some of the highlights of what I've been working on. Um, the first is we had a really great cleanup this past Saturday, and I know some of you were there. Chris, Jason, Siva, um, if I forgot anybody, Dennis, anybody else that's on the call that was there? Uh, thank you. Uh, all of you for being there. We did great. We we uh, did a, it was our first in-person event post-COVID. We had uh, around 20 volunteers, uh, 50 hours of community service hours, uh, and we collected uh, around 1,600 pounds of trash. And we could have done more, um, but it was very successful. And afterwards, uh, we did a site visit to the dumpster to get more information for our meeting uh, with Trout Unlimited on Monday to assess uh, the location of the dumpster and how it was impacting the river and how we could improve the, the water quality. Uh, so that's going on. Um, we are uh, in the process of making our plans for the Midsummer Nights meeting. It's gonna be Wednesday, July 7th. It's going to be at the Seeing Eye uh, we are planning uh, a, a, a nice event, so I hope that you will save that date, uh, July 7th, 5 to 8. We're going to get pizza brought in, and it'll be like just the old times, and uh, we'll be having an in-person meeting there. Um, I think the, the big push right now is the BioBlitz, and that's going to be on June 12th, so the next month is going to be very busy preparing for that, uh, but we definitely have an exciting day planned, and I hope that we'll see you all there for that. And um, lastly, we're going to be starting to make plans for a fall event at Pinot's Palette in Marstown. It's a painting studio, and we're going to be painting the Whippany. So it is going to be a fundraiser, and they are going to be working with us so that we can raise as many funds as we can. Uh, and I hope that all of you will join us for there. We don't have a date yet, but it'll be probably a weeknight in September. And uh, uh, that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. I, I have a question. Are we, um, are we going to, is this the time to discuss the cleanup? Uh, we can do that. Uh in a couple of minutes. Okay. All right, very shortly. Um, Allison, you have nothing else, right? So we're going to the old business. I know you have the Bethel cleanup first, but I'll talk about the out outreach uh, speech that I gave at Morristown Library two days before the cleanup on the 29th. And that went pretty well. I had, I think we had 16 people joining and it's also recorded, but I, the library hasn't posted it yet. And I just got a call from from uh, the, the um, who was it the Sierra Club, uh, the local Sierra Club yeah. chapter, and uh, I they arranged for me to speak on June, I think June 9th. So that that's going to be there. It's a week after a regular meeting, 
And that's uh, that, uh, so it's the Sierra Club is gonna be hosting that. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to, uh, uh, getting opportunities to talk about Orlac, uh, to uh, outside. And then we go into the Bethlehem Church cleanup. And uh, what, as Allison said, it was pretty successful. And, um, and we're looking to have uh, further cleanups, which we're gonna talk about in the new business. And uh, Dennis, did you have anything to add to that? I do. I have, a, I have two questions. Okay. Oh, uh, you know, a comment. Uh, the, the property that is between the river and the parking lot, who owns that? Uh, the river and the parking lot, is that uh, town? So the, are you talking about the- Where the, the bridge is? The, the large parking lot there? Yeah, where we park, yeah, where, where we set up. I believe the town owns that parking lot. All right. The, re the reason I'm asking is, is that, you know, I, I see the area there. They've got people had some uh, makeshift uh, blocks or whatever it was. And it's a, it's a hiding place for people to eat and they throw all their crap there. All right. 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 So, and, and somebody had mentioned that there was one, uh, said, they mentioned there was no garbage cans, but they said there was one garbage can across the street. Mm -hmm. To me, you know, in the amount of stuff that we were picking up in that area, it's like, uh, well, I get futile. You know, I mean, first of all, if people are going to go there, it's it's all hidden. It's got bushes. To me, I would think that I would try to make this more into a park-like setting where you have a garbage can and, and set it up. You know, we, we, we give... Uh, grants, et cetera, to put up a grain garden or whatever, which I think is, you know, great, commendable, but why don't we, you know, I don't know what direction to go that, that we make this into a, uh, a more of a park-like setting so that the people have more of an incentive to keep it clean because every year we go over there and pick up a lot of crap. Same so part. what I would suggest Dennis and Siva is that we take this offline and talk right. to, about it to a com, in a committee. Maybe do a a quick maybe quick we could do it visit, at our uh, quick uh, site uh, visit um, of the area and and assess it. You know, just take an hour. Doesn't even have to be that long, but just meet and and go over exactly what you're suggesting, and then we can approach the town and and go from there. Um, Along your lines, I, I do want to bring up the fact that there was some discussion about a snow pile. And uh, I did want to just bring that up. And I did bring that up issue with the Watershed Institute uh, this today. I'm on the board of the Watershed Institute uh, Steering Committee Council. And so I got some very good ideas on how to protect the river. And so we will be um, discussing that in the board and then approaching the, the town with some of these best practices. Okay, the other thing, if I'm just gonna throw something out so that uh, before our next uh, board meeting, and this is going to be directed to Larry, uh, yeah. you're involved with the county, correct? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I know that uh, Newark has a, uh, uh, snow melting machine, you know, whatever it was. I don't know, unfortunately, John is not here. I don't know if uh, uh, Madison, you know, keeps piles of, uh, uh, of snow, you know, uh, snow piles, you know, like Morristown does, or- uh, Or if the county does. Or the county does or whatever it was, <clears throat> but it would almost think that you could, because it's not being used like every day of the year, yeah. you know, that it doesn't matter because right now this pile has been sitting there for what, five months and it's still there. To me, you know, if you had a machine that would uh, melt the snow and then bring it around to the different municipalities, now it's something that can be used and then they could collect all the, yes, and I know Mr. Dumpster is going to comment there. <laughs> uh and then this way, a lot of towns can use it and it's not going to be so cost, you know, not going to be that expensive. Jason, do you have something to add? Uh, yes, if I may. Um, 
and I know I'm the new guy here. Uh, so and my only purpose is to to try and be a benefit. That's it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or usurp anyone's authority. The the concern with melting the snow is it requires a lot of energy, and you start uh, using this energy. And you know what I. <laughs> Nature is very important to me. That's why I'm a part of this. That's why I'm trying to help out here. So I, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm a tree hugger per se, but you know, I, I, I love nature, and if I can, if I can help preserve it, and um, you know, contribute to uh, the the beauty of it, then I will do so. My concern, sir, is the um, when you start melting snow, it is. Um, it is, first of all, it's extremely expensive. Uh, Madison, where I live, they, they just pile it. <clears throat> and what happens is when it melts, now, when I reviewed the, the uh, storage area, there's, there's things you have to consider. When you, melting is one and shipping it to another location is the other, but both require a great amount of energy. And you're talking thousands of tons of snow um the nice thing and, and and some may agree or disagree but the nice thing about having it in one location one it's it's accessibility to uh the machines to to quickly move it out of the way and get it out safely it's less traffic on the roads and also it's controlled now i i i, I understand the concern that it's near the watershed i i understand that totally Perhaps they put up fencing to keep the sediments from that from, uh, dissolving into into the water, into the ground. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, this snow, if it's not if it's not moved from point A to point B, it's going to melt, and it's still going to run into the watershed eventually. So uh, I I think while it is not it, it is unsightly. It's in the most reasonable place that is possible. That well, the doesn't problem is, is the garbage that's uh, collected with it. Agreed. And uh, that, that's, you know, it's, again, that same garbage, if it's left on uh, Morris Street, it's going to go right into the whatever system just the same. Um, in so some respects, it's a little easier to collect there. It's in one location. Yeah. And that's why what I do recommend, because I reviewed the area, is you put up a um a sediment fence silk that fence, abuts yeah. uh, a silt is it silt it's silk. a silt yeah. fence and um and that's one proposal that uh is a good proposal it's a it's a silt fence right. um the other concern is the the salt that is used because that's really what's going to hurt the river so we want to do a we have a, a call in to our friends to that do this to do a water quality sampling test at that location to to look at uh, the salt. Another call question we have is to look at conductivity. And then the fourth thing, which is probably the biggest thing from a cost standpoint, would be to look at the development of some kind of bioswale, which would help with stormwater management and retention to capture and to filter some of that uh, stuff before it goes into the river. Absolutely agree that, that we don't wanna create or waste more energy, but what we do is wanna develop a solution that is environmentally sensitive and friendly and that works. Like we had discussed, can't we, can't we put the snow somewhere else? I don't know if that's an option because if you haul snow and you're going through the town of Morristown and then the town of Morris, and then we go through Hanover, we're gonna be wasting more gas and increasing more of our footprint. So, so we're, we're looking at it, I would say for, for if, if you have any thoughts or further ideas, again, we could take this to committee, but the goal is, is to, to develop some kind of thought leadership response for the town to consider for the future. Yeah, the only comment that we that I received from the town was uh, this is the way we've been doing it for 30 years. And I just commented that you've been doing it for 30 years, but we don't have to do it for the next 30 years. Very good. Yeah, I, you're my kind of person. I, I, you don't, know, I like don't that response either. So that's why 
we will work together, come up with a very thoughtful response, go to the council, put it on record. And, uh, and, you know, and I have to say, I'm very grateful for the relationship that we've built with the Watershed Institute, because I met with them today and they were very good about giving us some, some, some real guidance, because these are all environmental scientists, people that are working in the, in the field. So, um, but we've talked about this a, a couple of times and there is a reality here. We, we do get snow and we get, sometimes we have years where we get a lot of it. So the, the, the challenge is just to come up with a workable solution that won't increase more waste or cause more harm to the environment. But just to give you an idea, the, the silt fence, that orange kind of material, that's a very low cost alternative, very low cost. Um, the water quality testing that we're going to, I'm going to see if the Marstown Baird School can do for us, very low cost. We, you know, the, the students are free. So, so, uh, so we're, we'll make progress on this, Dennis, and, and all. Um, I'm, I'm confident we will make progress. And, um, you know, the mayor didn't have to argue with me on Saturday, and I'm glad that we, we stopped, uh, it did it and stopped before it escalated. <laughs> the mayor, the mayor got very defensive. Um, I know he had to run away. He ran away. He got defensive. <laughs> uh, and you know, there's really no reason to elevate your voice and to get defensive. But, but I didn't mean to offend him. But apparently, some of the literature we we've received does say that the town is violating the governor's policy. The governor's policy on snow removal, the first bullet states that the snow should not be placed next to a waterway. It states very clearly, black and white, and the mayor was telling me that he wasn't in violation. So that's where, you know, I didn't push it. So, so we ended with, we will approach the council and we will um, but the other thing to keep in mind is snow removal in any town is, is an administrative issue. It's not one for the council or the committee. Now, if you have a, a committee form of government and they're the governing body, it's their responsibility. But usually there's one committee person that will be in charge with the Department of Public Works. In the town of Morristown, which is a, a mayor council form of government, it's not, the council is not responsible for snow removal. The administration is. So for the mayor to then argue with me further that it was a council issue was also not relevant. But I did not get into the details of the argument to, to, to be along the lines of what Jason is saying. We all wanna help. We all wanna do what's right. I just blew it off, let it go. It, it was very amicable. And I said, well, we will be in, back in touch with a thoughtful letter. Okay, thanks, Allison. Any uh, further to talk about that Morristown cleanup? Okay, so next. Uh... Oh, one, one, um, one, uh, one thing also, the uh, Ethan and I, we, we found two fan, uh, two fan motors. Mm -hmm. And that had to be at least 30 to 50 meters inside the woods. I. There's mm -hmm. no way that wash there, and this stuff is must be being dumped there. First of all, there is about 20 cars that are legal illegally on that property adjacent to the river. They shouldn't be there. Um, and and uh, I know the town is is working to rezone that area, but um, you know if there, you, you have an illegal dump there, that's an issue we need to look at too. There is illegal dumping. Um, but where are the cars that you're referring to? Are they on Bishop Naziri Way or on? They're in those condos on the on the left on the right hand side as you're going in. Okay. Again, let's let's take this offline because you know uh, the Warwack represents six to ten towns, not just the town of Marstown, okay. not just Hanover Township, and and you know we have to get to other towns, and that brings me to two 
improvement opportunities I identified for the cleanup for next year, I think it would really be awesome if we could do a multi-town cleanup on the same day and have a team leader in every town and say, this is Whippany River watershed and, and really build it up and, and remove you know, 20,000 pounds from the river. So I wanna shoot for that for next year, a multi-town yeah. cleanup and have Maybe all of you- and Actually, for, what, it, for, what it should be done is with the, uh, uh, in conjunction with, with each town's environmental green team. Exactly, yeah. I would really love to see that. Um, the yeah. second thing is, is for this particular cleanup, we have these poor volunteers trekking garbage bags across the parking lot because I was led to believe that we had to give the DPW one pickup location. So what I wanna find out is if we can have more than one pickup location because it was wasting volunteer hours and energy to bring the bags back. Um, so, so we almost need like a runner in a car or a truck that we can use to put the bags in to say, oh, do you need a new bag? Is your bag getting heavy? Here's a fresh bag um, and then give me your old bag. So, so I wanna implement that. And there was a third improvement that um, I thought of, but I can't think of right now, but I'd love to try to work toward a um, multi-town cleanup <clears throat> for next year. Thanks, Allison. And that goes into the new business. Um, I, because I'm in, uh, the chair of WARWAC, uh, and I think uh, anybody else who's involved, we get uh, notified by about different issues. I got notified uh, just last week. I got notified by three events, three things, including the snow mountain in Morristown, and the other one was uh, my friend Fern Walken talked about the cedar nose uh, issues, and um, so that. Just like what Allison was uh, selling, telling, we want to do a multi-town cleanup with uh, working with the green teams and environmental commissions. So um, I, I think Fern, you talked a little bit about that. You want to continue with that for anybody who missed it, because uh, because you you live in the area, so you sure, were... sure. So um, you know, I've been doing uh, walking through. Um, during COVID mm -hmm. along the river between, um, I guess it's Cedar Knolls Road by the Woodmont um, condos behind there, this path, and it goes all the way through into the woods. Um, I think they call it Hanover Connect or Connect Hanover. Um, and then it goes um, to Frederick Place where you can then further connect um, all the way through to the gardens, the public gardens that are in um, Hanover Township. Um, so I've been walking that for a year now. And um, in, in the beginning, um, you know, I noticed there was a fair amount of garbage. I actually brought with me plastic bags a couple of times and picked it up on my way back. But since then, I've been, you know, notice, noticing garbage is getting more and more. It seems like nobody ever cleans up there. There's a lot of it, there's a fence, and a lot of it is over the fence in addition to being on the pathway itself, but uh, it's between the fence and the river, a lot of stuff in there. And um, there's no way to even pick that up if I wanted to, um, but uh, it, it's just, it's just unsightly, it's a mess. And, um, and so, you know, I just wanted to know, and there is industry back there. So I know a lot of it is coming from that industry and I'd like to make them accountable for some of that. Um, but I, I, I would just, so I called my town and they basically said to me, it's not town owned, it's county owned. Um, and they would contact the county for me. I sent them photographs and whatever. And of course, I, you know, I haven't heard anything. I, I am told that they are following up on it. I'm not saying they're not doing anything, but um, in, in the meantime, you know, it's over the course of a year, it's pretty nasty. So that's it. I just wanted to know how, how we can do something like you just did in Morristown for Hanover and get that cleaned up as well. 
So, so Hanover has a great structure, uh, Fern. Um, Hanover has a green team, an environmental committee, and uh, what I was going and, to, if I and, could just interrupt, since I'm on the green team. Yes, I'm what sorry. I, that's yeah. what I told. I I, I texted um, uh, Fern. I said I was going to talk to her tomorrow, uh, and I would like to see exactly where you know, this area is, and I will bring it up to the green team. Now, Siva, you mentioned something about there's going to be a cleanup uh, schedule with Warwick in uh, Cedar Knolls? No, the, uh, that's what we want to see. Do we want to set something up to do? Okay, so what I was going to suggest is after I see what this area exactly is, I'll bring it up to the our green team, etc., mm -hmm. and maybe let's do this as a, it's not a, not, to me, I would prefer this to be a joint effort between Warwick right. and the Hanover Township Green Team Environmental Commission. If this yeah. is a joint effort between us, I don't want it to be Warwick is here to clean this. I want yeah. the Green Team to say, definitely. hey, to do that, if yeah, that's, that's okay with everybody. That's definitely what we are, we're looking at. Sounds great. And, and, and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of volunteers because uh, Fern was one, one person. There's another somebody else who also mentioned it, too. So I think we uh, once we get the word out, we we'll get uh, a lot, uh, probably as many volunteers as we get for. Um, Let's see what could, we could do, because at least if we do it with uh, uh, Hanover Township, because when we did something at the. Uh, 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 but B no, they did yeah. it at the B Metal Pond. Yeah, they had the uh, uh, the Boy Scouts or what are, somebody there doing it, and also the high school. Was okay. there. So if we could do this before the end of school year, you know, maybe we could really get something, uh, you know, moving. Sure. Yep. Jason's got his hand raised. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I, my son is uh, a fourth year uh, Cub Scout, and the one one of the all 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 Scouts are 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 asked as part of their annual requirement to to commit to service in the community. Um, and the nice thing about this, it's outdoors. So the, those concerned with, you know, infection or COVID or whatnot, they, right. uh, it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. And, you know, with all these different communities, you know, I can take back to PAC 226 here in Madison and PAC 7 and say, look, they're doing a cleanup. Um, and I know we talked about possibly doing one in a couple of weeks or so just a spontaneous, you know, gathering over on um, that street that we talked about, um, Malcolm Street. Right. Uh, I, I think we, you know, even if you get two or three people, you get, that's two or three garbage bags, less that's going to be there, you know, a year from now. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Judy? Um, we had a cleanup a couple of weeks ago, and it was about 350 people that came to Parsippany, and we made it like they were doing the Booten Reservoir, but they also were doing other areas and people were going solo if they didn't feel comfortable. But the town provided buses to get to the reservoir. Long story short, there was um, one of the people on my green team is starting an innovative project for Sustainable Jersey. And he's with the Sewa group. Are you familiar with that, Siva? It's a service yeah. group. And yeah. they alone had like a couple hundred people. And they've created an app that they want to do on Persephone. But I think this might be worth, like if you're having these other cleanups, to ask them if they want to participate. Because it's all about volunteer and right. service. And the app is like to adopt a street in your area to clean up. And, you know, you document what you're finding so people become aware of... You know, so maybe, you know, when you're doing these, I can reach out to them. That's my point of telling you about this, yeah. to reach out to these groups, because it, it was so successful that the mayor said, let's do this again, not just in April, but let's do it in the autumn as well. Yeah, that's and, what I wanted uh, to ask about. Uh, how did okay. you, how did uh, Persephone get their uh, multi-place, um, multi-location cleanups? And I, and I guess uh, it took you, what, at least a month to organize or more? Yeah, well, you know, uh, this one young man decided he wanted to ask people from Rutgers to come and do it. And then we had a little girl who wanted, um, that I was running with for council not too long ago, asked the Persephone Environmental Committee, but then COVID happened, if she could clean up. So we all got together and with Parks and Rec said, 
let's all do this together in 2021 because we can open up things a little bit. And we just put different locations in the town and people met at the PAL. The buses went to the reservoir. A lot of people wanted to do that, I've got to say. <laughs> but other people did, you know, uh, with the Sewa group, they had like pickers and, and they went and they, the town provided bags. They asked Home Depot for gloves. But most people brought their own stuff. And it was just, I don't know if it was just what people wanting to get out, but I was surprised because sometimes to get people motivated is so difficult. Yet we, you know, we had so many people doing it and we're excited. And, and like the 400 people signed up, we had a sign up sheet, I'm not saying that they all came, but if you look on Persephone green team, I have a Facebook page in the township, you'll see some of the videos. And I just think that, um, I, I don't know. I think we, I, I just think we should be aspirational. Sure. And yeah, try to ask as many people to get involved. And, uh, you know, and I'm sorry I didn't make it last week, but that's oh, for other reasons. Well, well, where did uh, <laughs> where did you collect all the garbage? I mean, was there? A... I went with Riley, the the kid that okay. wanted to do it because I'm on the Persephone Environmental Committee, and so we did um, roads, uh, big roads that lead to 46, and then we went on 46 a little bit, and it's just so gross. It's amazing what you find that people you know throw them out of your car. A car. Right. And um, on the side of the road, and like Allison was saying, you know, there's certain areas that you can't, or or Fern was mentioning, you, there you can't get to, like between the fence and the reservoir. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we just alert them to the fact that there's a lot that's been just dumped. It's not even just on the trail because the reservoir is going to open up as trails. I guess you might have heard that in Boot yes. Reservoir it's for everybody. So. Um, so that was one of the initiatives, but it's all off, not even on the trails, it's off to the side. And it's just, I found the bumper <laughs> a couple of weeks ago in, in Troy Meadows. So like, you know, you think of like, how do these things get there? <laughs> anyway, so I don't want to take up time, but like, you know, I'd like to brainstorm it and push a little bit. Some of the I people. Think, I but... think we need. We need to create a, a subcommittee uh, for for cleanup, a uh, cleanup yeah. for next year. Um, yeah. And, and then I just have two curiosity, quick questions, Judy. Um, you mentioned a, a organization, Saber. Could you spell that or? It's Saver, S E V A, which is a Hindi word, which is like a volunteer um, effort. It's so, the way yeah, you're supposed to say Siva's name. Yeah, so he, yeah. He, he, he says it's S-C-W-A. Maybe that's like an American. Yeah, 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 yeah sometimes it's like, yeah, it's a, they pronounce W as V sometimes. They are so motivated that they came out when I was doing, I was doing a plastic bag ban ordinance for Persephone a couple of years ago and had 300 people sign a petition and all these kids came to the town meeting that shamed the council into voting for the <laughs> ordinance because there were so many people there. So yeah. I, you know, if you if you want him to visit one of our meetings um, yeah. at that sometime or- I just was know, curious uh, who, so yeah. who organized that cleanup? Who, who- Oh, um, the town itself. It was a group effort. It was, it was a group effort, but it was predominantly this young man from Rutgers, the little girl who wanted to do it, Mayor Soriano saying, yeah, okay, go ahead. And then somebody from the PAL who organized, um, not the PAL, but, but he used to work for the PAL, but he works with the administration now. So, um, you know, if, if you're if you're coming to Parsippany in a couple of weeks or if it's coming, I could, we could talk about that with the mayor. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious. Um, you said there were mm -hmm. 350 people. That's huge. Um, so it was sponsored by the town. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so uh, that's that's just all I wanted to know. But um, I do want to mention that we that Warwac got publicity coverage from the cleanup on um, Saturday and. Thank you uh, to Larry and to um, Siva. It's already been posted on social media. I just wanted to mention because we did get press coverage for Werwax. So, yeah, Morristown.com had a nice article. Yeah, they did a really oh, nice okay. write up. And we had I three pictures. Share that too. Yeah, please mm -hmm. share that with your towns. It's good. 
publicity for Judy, it's on, it's on my Facebook page if you want to check it. Okay. And Judy, I think you also brought up the area of Ridgedale Avenue and how badly that was polluted. I don't, I think it was you that you wanted that cleaned up. Uh, I just want to say that it's the area along between East Hanover as it crosses 280 yeah. and approaches New Road. I just want to let you know that uh, we at the MUA are going to be sponsoring and paying for a couple of cleanups along that area of Ridgedale Avenue leading up to New Road. Of course, I know that's incredibly polluted and uh, it's mm. inaccessible and like uh, the areas Fern was discussing. Yeah, really I'm, difficult I'm not sure if I to spoke do. to you about oh, that. Okay. Maybe, maybe Cynthia Corman, because we're working maybe with it was. some of the uh, DPW uh, stuffing. Anyway, so we're, with you. I know we're going to be sponsoring and uh, hiring to do two uh, significant cleanups between like East Hanover and uh, New Road over the next few, uh, I think next couple of months. I think I've got yeah, two cleanups okay, great. going. So, oh, yeah. that's great to hear. Larry, is um, is that going to be for WORWAC or for MUA or? Uh, that's just, uh, hey, I'm hiring a company to do it because those are areas that are very high traffic. And so I've got a company that comes in with trucks and uh, proper equipment. And there's a lot of heavy stuff along there, as you can imagine. It's a lot of yeah. illegal dumping. So you find the bathtubs and the tires and the, so. Uh, is there any way we can jointly do a joint project with Warwack volunteers so that we nah, can- Nah, yeah, I don't allow any people. It's very dangerous areas. I don't like anyone going there. And uh, that's okay. why I pay a company doing uh, this area. And, heavy traffic uh, area then? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. like, uh, it's, it's crazy. Okay. We used to have people doing it there then. Uh, okay. My risk management people are like, uh, no more. Uh, All right. So that's being sponsored by the MUA. <clears throat> well, the I'll say this. We get clean community funds where we pay for cleanups and we do cleanups. So uh, that's part of our use of our funds is hiring this uh, adopt a road company to do some cleanups for us at our in the more crowded uh, county roads that are too dangerous for individuals to do it. Okay. okay. Right, I think, uh, so we'll, we'll set up some, uh, try to set up a subcommittee for cleanup, cleanup efforts and uh, get something going, mm -hmm. especially, uh, and then Dennis, you can, uh, and you can let us know about uh, your discussion with Fern about that location. And we can uh, do a joint effort with your town screen team. Okay, and then uh, Allison. So you, you want to talk about the dumpster removal project and dumpster dollars now? Yeah. Okay, so uh, we had a great meeting with Trout Unlimited Monday. It's the start of, I think, a really good partnership with them. Um, thank you, Jason and Siva for being there. And then we had another volunteer help us. So uh, right now we're working on a press release. We hope we can get the project noticed. Um, we uh, did definitely identify some specific uh, issues going on. So it was a really good meeting. Um, the idea is, is to set up a fundraising program called Dumpster Dollars. Uh, we don't want to announce that program formally yet because we want to make sure we really understand what, what we have to do um, we are just, we have gotten one estimate. We really should get a couple more estimates to see about how much it would cost to remove. Uh, but, but I just wanted to just kind of bring you all up to date with that program. Um, so, so that's really um, it. We're still trying to get it removed. Um, it is an eyesore. It's also rusting. Jason took great pictures. Um, we could create something on the shared drive to show you all the pictures. We have the serial numbers now of the dumpster. Um, and uh, and we're gonna have a, do a water quality testing there. So we'll be able to determine how the water is. One idea that was suggested by Trout Unlimited, which is very, very affordable, is to invest in a water log. It's called a water log and you put it in the water, it 
it's a data collection tool. I guess it looks like a log. You don't even notice it's there. And it collects, oh great, James, so handy. He's showing <laughs> pictures. He's doing a slideshow behind him if you want to um, put Jason on speaker and just, I can okay. narrate the, the uh, situation. But they, the guys from Trout Unlimited, um, uh, they were great. I ended up, one is a fellow puppy raiser from Chatham. And um, so I knew his wife. So it was amazing. And I really believe that only good things can happen as this, as we start to unravel this. But um, they suggested a water log. So it, it captures uh, temperature, dissolved oxygen, alkalinity, pH, all the kind of stuff that you do with the water quality testing, but it does it automatically all year round every day so you don't have to go there and it it traps the data kind of like the chronolog um but it's it's a different sort of system so, so this, this so, is a hard set system so it's you called it, a, leave it. it calls a it's called a water log and it it's a um water quality testing and uh john montefusco who is one of the guys that we met with with from Trout Unlimited and Jonathan Ang um, uh, were the two men that we met with. John Montefusco said it costs like a hundred bucks. Is now we'd have to research it, you know, again. But if it's that little, I would recommend that we buy two of them, one for where the snow mountain was, and one mm -hmm. for where the dumpster is in Morris Township bordering Hanover um, and start to look at the water and see if there are any impacts. Really try to scientifically look at this. So I was going to um, look into that and uh, I just wanted to let you know these kinds of developments. Um, the other thing we discovered, um, um, I know I just want to finish, is that there a trail could be developed from Malcolm Street to where the dumpster is. These two fly fishermen didn't even know that this stream was there and they said it was wonderful. Um, you'll see in my press release, I talk about the bugs and how good the water was for fishing. They thought it was a great, great area. So, so Siva knows someone who can build a trail from Malcolm to where the dumpster is. Of course, we're not going to call it the dumpster trail, but maybe we could. <laughs> but that's one project that unfolded this weekend. And another potential project that unfolded this weekend is that Jason and I must have picked up about 100 bottle caps in front of this Whippany River hangout, where a fence is partially covering uh, the area, and then there's this open area and someone could fall in right off of Patriot's Path and Martin Luther King. Um, it's like a, a clearing. And if someone fell down, they could definitely get injured. But people are hanging out there because there's all these bottle caps that they, they take the bottle cap and then they put it into the ground and they create like this mosaic of bottle caps. <laughs> And uh, we picked up a bunch of them. And so the fence really needs to get improved there. So, so there's definitely some improvements that could be made in this area that we could draw attention to this um, pro project. And, uh, you know, I think it would be uh, great if we could, we could look into these. Um, they're all next to the river. And another last point about the dumpster, and this is in my press release, is that, you know, the Whippany River is drinking water, a source of drinking water. And, and Jason has pictures of the rust going into the river. So, you know, this is something, now granted, the water gets treated, but still, you don't want to have to um, have a dumpster rusting. So, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned all these things since the meeting's being recorded. These are all very good ideas. And um, it would be wonderful if we could get a trail. There's, there's already an Indian trail from Malcolm Street to where the dumpster is. 
And, and the other thing is, is people are hanging out there because there was a basketball, a soccer ball, a bicycle. We saw a cooler. We saw all this trash by the river. And um, the guys from Trout Unlimited said they could help us with the cleanup too. And they could clean this up in two to three hours, they said. And we so, thought, I think we could think about a September date or something for that. Yeah, we were looking at a September date. Supposedly there's a boat in, in a Hanover storage shed somewhere. And um, they said if they have the rowboat, they, they can walk the river and then haul the trash in the rowboat and they can get a lot of stuff. But Jason, we saw another bicycle there. We saw, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff, so. It was a Huffy, I saw it too. <laughs> it was a Huffy, 1970s. <laughs> yeah. Has it been there since or is it new? No. <laughs> it's, it's definitely either from uh, a resident up on the street above it or yeah. it was flood water. Hmm. Okay, so is that? So that project is evolving. I just wanted to report. Okay, and um, I'll talk. Uh, uh, I think I'll uh, wait to get Damon to talk about the committee openings. But uh, we're going to have a Morris Plains Memorial Day parade. I think on May 29th, the Saturday. I'll be there with the uh, new banner. Just need another volunteer, and anybody else would like to be there. Let us know. And uh, Can you let me know tonight because the deadline is today um, to get back to the Marstown Memorial Committee. Mars so are there any volunteers here who can commit to walking in that parade? You have to get there at 8.30 a.m. Um, there will be a parking assignment. They are uh, adhering to masks and social distancing. Um, and so, oh, so, um, so I would need to know tonight, can, can anybody here commit to walking um, in that? <clears throat> you know, I'm gonna be there, but I'm gonna be there for the MUI, so I can't. Oh, I know. Yeah, we have to, we have to I, wear a mask outside. Well, it sounds like that you do. Um, That's what they're requiring, I guess. That's yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm immunized, why do I need a mask? I know, I know. It was, it's, Maybe it'll evolve by then, knock on wood. Yeah, it probably will. I can't, I'm sorry, because I'm running for council and I have to be at another parade. <laughs> if, Ethan, if Ethan doesn't have, uh, if it isn't with the Boy Scouts that day, because they do a, a Memorial Day thing, because it's a special day for, for obvious reasons. Um, right. um, because I actually served in the United States Airborne myself. And some of you don't are privy to that information, but uh, there's there's a couple things that we do the the veterans do locally. So if if they postpone that for the same reasons, then you know I'll make myself available, but I can't come in unfortunately. So Siva, can you reach out to Jen and see if she can be, or or do you just want me to 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 register us and you will get one or two more volunteers to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re register us and uh, see if, if we can't, we can't, but uh, we'll try to get somebody. Even if we have to invent a poll for you to hold or something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I, I can't remember why I can't do it. I'll look at my schedule again. I think, oh, I know why. Um, I'm marching with the Seeing Eye Puppy Raisers, but I don't know for sure if we're marching. So um uh if if but if i do it i would want to bring my seeing eye puppy to get the exposure and i really can't hold the banner while <laughs> while handling him okay so if did they want, say no dogs by the way i thought i heard that is that oh, but seeing eye are, are always allowed oh that's there. different okay yeah because they're nervous dogs they're in training so if you look behind jason you can see the rust that's going into the river there mm. Um, all right, I'll register. Yeah, and if we can't make it, then that's... Uh, that Dennis, is... you, can't, you can't make it, Dennis? I'll ask any you're of them more time. You're muted. You're, you're muted, Dennis. You're muted. 
right now I cannot commit. That's my problem. Okay. okay. All right. I'll ask uh, around. Uh, the other reason I needed to know names is because you fill out a form and you will get acknowledged. So if you are seeking publicity, notoriety, your name will be no, out I'm, there. Uh, incognito. So, so, um, okay. Okay. Me too. And um, I don't know if we want to talk about the committee openings because they're not. There's only six of us here, but we are looking at committee openings for uh, education and outreach, which is what I was doing uh, for the last couple of years, going to uh, different uh, areas, talking about watershed. And uh, I think we're also looking for a program committee chair, which is uh, probably cleanup is one of the programs, and then membership. We're trying to expand our membership to do that but because we got to have large members and then um and so if anybody's interested email me if you want to see the descriptions and are interested i can send you the descriptions and uh, yeah and also let us know what your towns need i mean uh, uh, like fern just told us about cedar knows because she knew i'm in the committee uh, so that's why uh, I knew about that. And thankfully, Dennis is also here. So Dennis and Vern can talk about that. And I think John Hoover just left. So he, he was going to talk about the virtual wine tasting. But if you are sort of going to do a Pinot Wharton, Pinot, Pinot's palate in September. I, I think it would painful. be more fun if we could do it in person. And if we if we can do the Pinot's palate uh, paint the whippany and I know that that's been an idea that Larry's had for a while but we got halted yeah. from the pandemic so I think if we pick that up we'd be combining sort of the wine and cheese because you can have re refreshments there and then also the activity which I think would be a lot of fun I did ask them if they could come to the bio blitz and if they would be interested in doing that but there was a, a charge for them per person to come off site mm -hmm. and it was very complicated and she needed to know exactly how many kits, kits she and needed. And, and, I, and so we, we, be too, too, too we much talked problem. about doing that for next year. So I think this will mm -hmm. plant the seed for September. We just need to decide um, on what date would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that's, you know, that's always the question. Um, uh, and then when I meet with her, she sent me some information. So I was going to volunteer Larry and go over the information she sent us and then come up with a plan. Yeah. And a price that looked plan. like a win. I, I read over that. That looked like a win win. I so, thought that was a win win. So um, looked easy to do. And <clears throat> whoever yeah. shows up will enjoy it. Then we'll make some donation money and we'll come out with many cool pictures of the river. It is indoors, and she did say as of right now, we would have to wear a mask while we're painting, um, and then, but we wouldn't have to wear a mask if we were eating or drinking wine and cheese and stuff. So, so, um, well, hopefully by September. That's I know. Really. You have to see. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, <laughs> Jason's painting. <laughs> so, the one thing I wanted to ask her was, is if we could use one of your pictures. Um, Siva and Larry have taken, and now Jason had a beautiful picture up that he took just on Monday. Um, I'd like us to use one of our photos. Uh, yeah, I would prefer to paint the whippany instead of uh, a famous art picture of uh, some uh, random. Okay. Yeah, so we have to negotiate that. We have to convince, yeah, we have to convince them of that. We have to get, so that is one piece of the puzzle that we have to do for the planning of this, is we have to uh, find the right um, photo and pick the right photo and then get them to buy into that idea. Okay. All right, thanks. And uh, is there any other uh, items that we missed? Uh, I think we got everything on this list. I know we talked so much a, a lot, especially about cleanups and past cleanups and future ones. And we got the executive committee in two weeks. That's gonna be the afternoon, one o'clock. Yep. And our next uh, meeting is June 2nd. That's gonna be with our watershed ambassador, Brian, the outgoing watershed ambassador, Brian Pinky. Well, our executive committee meeting is in two weeks. And then right. next mm -hmm. month, our 
our action committee is going to be with our watershed ambassador. Yeah. But in two weeks, we have the Persephone rain garden cleanup. So yeah, that's 15th and 16th. And so do you need rain planning to go there to do that? Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. What, so, what is that? It, Siva, can you give us the dates and the times? Is it both okay. days? It's both days. It's uh, for March, 5th, May 15th and 16th, Saturday and Sunday, between 11 and 2. So it's three hours, three hours, and it's cleaning up the rain garden, taking out the weeds, and maybe putting some mulch and everything. Uh, uh, there's going to be a, a Boy Scout troop, and um, I think our old chair, Len Sipkin, is uh, involved in that. And uh, that's that? at the Parsippany Municipal, Municipal Building. We right. built two or three rain gardens that need four. Four. maintenance. Four? four. Uh, that need maintenance. So I think a bunch yeah. of Boy Scouts are coming up then. Yeah. Know. <laughs> I see somebody uh, photobombing. <laughs> it's my daughter. <laughs> Hi. 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 It's at the municipal building in Parsippany. Volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great. I'd like to uh, um, ask the township to advertise that. So, um, so um, I'll, I'll okay, contact sure. you for some info. Okay, sure. Uh, so they can put it out to the town. Yeah, I got it. Just so they know what's going on. Hey, I got a couple of photos I can send you and you can uh, post that up. Okay, cool. Okay. And Siva, let me know if you need need my services to go. Um, okay. I, I don't think I can make it on Sunday. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't have to take uh, both days, but. Um, on, on, on Saturday, um, well, we can talk offline. Okay, sure. I did have an event with the seeing eye puppies are going to the intrepid and we're taking all the dogs onto this boat but to be honest with you i'm kind of claustrophobic you got everything don't you <laughs> so i don't know if i really want to go it's a full day event but um but, Scouting. yeah J jason you're our prop master <laughs> it's like wonderama <laughs> wonderama well, this was a great meeting tonight. Yeah. I, I really loved the speaker. I think when we have creative, um, innovative uh, speakers that are still all about nature, um, it, it's, it's enlivening. Uh, not to say that we shouldn't have speakers talk about stormwater utility and management and all of that stuff, but let's face it, those kinds of topics are, are very dry. Um, we do have a guest speaker open for, um, uh, we do just a quick action item. Um, we do have a, a meeting where we haven't filled in um, and that is uh, on October. And I was thinking October 6th. Um, I don't know if we'll be at the county or not, but that's a time when stormwater drains get really clogged. And yeah, I brought it up with the watershed council today about finding out someone who'd be a good uh, person to talk to. Again, this isn't as riveting as wild birds, but um, there are some best practices with storm drain management. And there's some innovative companies out there that are experimenting with orthoscopic equipment that will go in and determine whether um, storm drains are you know, doing what they're supposed to be doing. The bottom line is, is when they collect with leaves and the leaves decompose, this is not good. It, it's not good. You do not want the storm drains to fill up. Um, it could be a launch of, a, of, a, of an innovative program for WORWAC called um, the, there's a storm drain steward, you know, be a storm drain steward. And some watershed groups are, have coined this program called um, be a storm drain steward. And uh, that could be a good way to bring in the youth. So, so I was thinking if I can identify a, or if any of you know anyone, that would be a good time of year to bring in someone since it is October and that's when the leaves start to fall. Um, uh, it would just show that Warwack is on top of trends and 
being current and it's a good um, a good time to um, to do that. So that was my thinking for the October meeting and then we would be all booked. Um, okay. So. All right, thanks. And um, uh, did, uh, Jason, did you have something or? Yeah, I just wanted to mention, uh, I've been a six year volunteer for Coco Ross and I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, um, but no. the, the the Coco Ross organization is the, it's basically um, the uh, community collaborative uh, rain, hail and snow network. And what they do is, and I think it directly impacts us, uh, or at least indirectly. And, and what it is, is it monitors um, the watersheds and, and, a, and a daily 24 hour, um, 24 hour, um basically 24 hour every 24 hours we report on what what is looking like in in our watershed and again this is something that is something that directly affects us so i'm just plugging that in okay. um, for consideration i can provide more details later yeah provide more information for us and and everybody this photo yeah. jason took this is right where the dumpster is it's right so on it gives you an idea of how beautiful that stream is right there. Um, it's a beautiful trout stream. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> so, so that would be a good picture for the paint the whippany. Um, what, what we can do is we could make a contest out of it if people wanted to give their best photo and then we vote at an action committee meeting that would be a fun agenda item. Maybe it would bring in some people because everybody likes, we all know we have to vote and we want to encourage voting. <laughs> and I, I say we need some sky in the picture. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there's anything, <laughs> uh, nothing else. Uh, have a well, motion. Are we in, are we in new business? What? No, that we, we just finished new business. Oh, that was uh, just, just for the just for the good of the order, something to consider, and, and I'm happy to do it. Um, what if we did a videography um, starting at the, the source of the Whipping River all the way to its terminus? Um, I, took, I took still photos of that, um, but video would be a good way to do it. What, what I'm suggesting is it will be a time lapse and you know, from boat to, to from walking the river to boat, you know, canoeing it or something from the term from the uh, origin up near the Clyde Potts Clyde Potts mm -hmm. uh, Reservoir yeah exactly of that even um, where I live by where I lived for most of my my uh, ute and you would take that all the way to its terminus now it would be what I'm envisioning is something where we have a time lapse where someone could actually traverse the length of the river and in a video which would be really neat it would be. Um, just, just something to think about. Um, I don't think any part of the weaponry goes underground in like uh, tunnels or anything like that, other than bridges. Yeah. So I think it's something that is doable, and um, it'd be it'd be a really neat resource that people can click on the website and watch a video of the the because some of these things this like hidden nature, and I know some people want to keep that a secret, um, and that's good. But um, it just be a, a neat historical value because people would see a documentation of what the river looks like today, and you know, you know, maybe in the future mm. it, it gives the people a balance uh, of, of star player. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's something to think about. Thanks, and um, cool. yeah, I nice think we idea. talked. A, we talked a lot of it today, uh, but. Uh, well, is there a motion to uh, end the meeting? Just uh, even though we've covered a lot of information today, I'll make a motion. Second. I will second. Okay, so uh, a motion to uh, adjourn. Aye. Uh, okay, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank hey, you. Al.